Falcons Audible presented by AT&T is back as we are each and every week. A little bit of a different look this week. Uh-huh. We are uh, down one. Down uh, Arch, down Arch will not be joining us this week, but he will be back with us next week. And um, so finish. so we will just fill in for him admirably. Right, BJ? Tr- I mean, we can wink, only try. Wink. We can only try. We can only try to live up to one Dave Archer. Yeah. I He's mean. not here. Um, but DJ Shockley <laughs> is, and myself, Derek Rackley. Uh, so here's what we are going to discuss real quick today. Obviously, we will dive into the Falcons' loss, uh, 31-28 to the Vikings. Um, we'll talk a little about Taylor Heineke and his performances, maybe some other players as well. Uh, maybe visit some of the recurring issues or problems that Atlanta is having and what they need to do to get over the hump. And then we'll start talking a little bit about Arizona, uh, what they're going to be facing this weekend as the Falcons travel on the road. And then maybe if we have time, we'll get into a little bit of a state of the NFC South as it stands right now this season. So, DJ, let's get into it. We the, One of the biggest issues of this game or biggest storylines, if you will, probably a better word, is the kind of the battle of the backup quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jaron Hall was going to be the starter for the Vikings, as he was, although that didn't last very long, and Taylor Heineke for the Atlanta Falcons. So let's talk a little bit about Heineke. Break down for the people that are listening and watching what you saw from Taylor Heineke, some things that he did good, and some areas that need to be improved upon. Now, obviously, I think this was an interesting situation coming in with, you know, you being the, a guy who's been around the league a while. You understand what it's like to take over a team or take over midseason and have to do your particular job. And Taylor, you know, for the most part, I thought he played a solid ball game. Now, there were some instances where, you know, you want a couple throws back. I yep. mean, there were a couple where, obviously, they dropped it, and it could have been an interception on your hand. You had that one bad interception on the dig route. And a lot of the conversation was, okay, was there situations in the game where he was off with his receivers? Because you felt like there were a couple times where the ball was, like, really behind him. Yeah. Or you felt like maybe the receiver didn't come out his route good enough. But we would never know that unless we sat right. down right. with Dave Ragone and Arthur Smith and went through all the different things that goes into – Uh, a particular concept or play. But when I think about Taylor Heineke, I thought, again, he played a really good ball game from the standpoint of being able to move this offense. He made plays when he needed to. He made some big-time throws. I thought he had a big-time run on third down to extend a drive one time. And you scored 28 points. You score the most points you scored all season long. And that tells you, I think, over the last two ball games with him in, you scored 48 total points, I think it is with him taking over as a quarterback. So you know there has been some progression as far as scoring touchdowns, being able to, uh, you know, move this football team. But there's always definitely room to go. And we talked about before we came on. There were opportunities that were absolutely missed in this yeah, ballgame yeah. uh, from the offensive side of the ball. Uh, but I also give this offense a lot of credit for what happened towards the end of the game where you needed to go down and score. And you not only scored, you know, you not only, you know, kicked the field – kicked an extra point. You, you actually scored a touchdown. Tyler Algier, the key had the ball the last six plays yeah. of that drive that gives you the lead. And he made a couple big-time throws. The throw to Canero Hodge and a cover two honey hole over here uh, early in the ball game. He hit Kyle Pitts down the seam a couple times. Um, there were a couple plays in this ball game where you say, all right, the ball comes out of his hands quicker. Yep. He makes really quick decisions. And, of course, like I just mentioned, in any ball game, you're going to have instances where – yeah, yeah, yeah. You have some bad throws. Some you want back. I've been yeah. there before. Yeah. But I thought overall, I thought Heineke did a really good job of moving this offense and kind of operating within what Arthur Smith likes. Twenty-one of thirty-eight, fifty-five percent completion rate in the game. Two hundred sixty-eight yards and a touchdown. Uh, as you mentioned, they did score the twenty-eight points, which was the most this season. Uh, previous high was twenty-five points uh, back in Week Two against the Packers. I think DJ and again like. We have to we have to kind of be honest with what the performance was. Like it was a missed opportunity to get a victory. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about some of the positives, but I just want everybody to understand. Like we're not um, understating the fact that, like in the NFL, you are there to win football games. Yeah, like no you can sit here and talk about stats all you want, but you are based off of your win loss record. Okay. So we're not going to sugarcoat any of that. DJ, I think it, you got to go back to the second quarter though. The big talking about missed opportunities, the turnover, they get the sack fumble from Ebicady. Lorenzo Carter brings it back to the one yard line, and we end up coming away with a field goal. And to me, that was a huge missed 
opportunity sure. because you rarely ever get field position like that in a football game to start first and goal at, at the, the one-yard one. line. Yeah. And you get a procedure penalty, which Arthur Smith talked about it yesterday, is pre-snap penalties are completely controllable by yourself. Sometimes things that happen within the play may not end up being controllable. It might be a technique issue. But concentration, not only that, but knowing what the defense is going to do. Because Arthur Smith said that he knew that Brian Flores does some <laughs> shifting and stemming oh, and different man, things on the defensive he? side of the ball all the way going back to his days at New England. Oh yeah. So they knew it. They yeah. talked about it, but they still fell victim to it. And your very first play, you go from first and goal at the one to first and goal at the six. six yeah. That, to me, was a – it was early in the game, so it's like, oh, you got plenty of time to fix this mistake. But that's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah, it's. I believe it's one of those things where – even though you got down there, it's a downer because there's a difference from the one-yard line to the six-yard line for any offense, regardless. I don't care what happens. And it kind of steals a little bit of the momentum yeah. you have because the yeah. call now is a lot different from the one-yard line as it is from the six-yard line because now you're trying to make up that yardage or, you know, obviously after a turnover, you want to make them pay immediately. And – you mentioned it. I thought the procedural penalties was something that really hurt the Falcons throughout the game. There were a couple uh, illegal formations in the ball game that, that hammered you. You had the, the the false starts in the ball game, and I think that's one of the things that hurt you throughout the ball game was those procedural penalties that didn't give you the momentum you had going into a particular drive, or you got a drive going and something happened. So, interesting enough, you mentioned that second quarter kind of um, you know situation or, or occurrences. It absolutely was, I think, a damper on a particular drive yeah. or a particular game going in because at that point you could go up and be double digits at that point, but you end up just kicking a field goal. So you mentioned penalties. I think it's interesting to note in the game there's a lot of statistics that get thrown around. Penalties, Atlanta, 8 for 62, Minnesota, 1 for 4. Wow. wow. So, so conversely, what did Minnesota do well in this game? They didn't shoot themselves in the foot. Right, which is is such a big thing about staying on schedule, and and you think obviously about what they had to deal with in the game, a backup quarterback that essentially took all the reps during the week because Kirk Cousins' injury, and then they had a guy that they just traded for that came to the building on Tuesday. His first practice was on Wednesday. Right. Supposedly didn't take any reps all week. Yeah. And okay, and then in the first quarter he gets thrusted into the game. OK, so all of these things are working out in the favor of Atlanta. But then Minnesota, with their lack of penalties and getting a couple of turnovers, that's just how you can turn the tides in the National Football League. And I think we've talked about it numerous amount of times about if you come into a ball game and you feel as though the advantage is for you, but you give a team any kind of hope. And you talk about hope as far as the turnovers. You give hope as in opportunities left behind and now you look up and it's oh it's five to three oh it's it's eight to three mm -hmm. oh it's 11 you know what i'm saying so you keep giving them the chance hey we're still only one yeah. possession away in this ball game and i think that ultimately was the biggest key for minnesota was yeah they knew they were down yep. they knew this was a situation where it was going to be an uphill battle they came in the game not being able to run the ball at all anyway you knew coming in there's a new quarterback all you want to do is turn around and throw and hand him hand the ball off because yep. it's going to be tough enough to throw it. So you gave them a little hope, and I think that's ultimately what led to this game being a lot closer than it should have been. Very simply on the sidelines, your leaders, to your point, DJ, if you're on Minnesota, you can say, guys, as bad as it's been so far in this game, we're right. down, call it eight to three. Like yeah. we are one or two plays from not only getting back into the game, but taking the lead. And so that's kind of the perspective that you give another team when you don't make them pay for mistakes, i.e. the second quarter drive Atlanta had where they're not able to punch the ball in for a touchdown. That score seems a little bit more insurmountable for another team, whether on their, on their second quarterback, True. just coming off of a sack fumble, giving the ball to the team, and boom, they punch it in for a touchdown. Instead, it's the defense is they're lit because they just they just got a field goal attempt yeah. when most teams are scoring a touchdown. Yeah. So the red zone issues continue to be a little bit of um, a problem and the goal line, I should say. Atlanta, 50% in the red zone, 19th in the NFL. So you're not saying that they're 30th to 32nd, but they're still in the middle of the pack, but some missed opportunities in the red zone. Some other things I guess you could look at from a positive standpoint, Young Way Koo, 28 points in the Ooh. game. Um, so that's one thing Atlanta always knows is that they get into 
field goal range. They feel like they can almost count on the fact that we're going to have points, not to mention the fact that he has scored 72 of the 166 points for the Falcons this year, 43.3% wow. of the points. Good and a bad, right? Yeah, yeah, Good and a bad. Yeah. You probably want more points from your <laughs> offense, but the the know that you've got a kicker that's going to do his job when he Here, comes on the field. Here's something that's so interesting about Koo. I, lo- I found out this. Koo is, we talk about the clutch gene and being able to get points and you move across a certain part of the field. You feel like, all right, we have points. Koo is 18 and 19 from 51 to 55 yards. <laughs> I mean, we look around the National Football League, and there's guys missing extra points. There's guys missing, you know, routine 35 yarders. And we got a kicker who every time he steps out there, you feel great about where this football is headed and you're going to get points on the scoreboard. So uh, a lot of a lot of credit to Koo, a lot of credit to that whole operation because it goes, yep. you know, from, you know, the snap to the hole, from pinion to, yep. you know, Koo, you know, line it up. So uh, give that unit a lot of credit for uh, just getting points when absolutely uh, you need it. I think um, what's interesting, to know, actually in the game too, remember when Minnesota ended up accepting the penalty to, to back him up on the extra point, thinking mm. there's a chance that he misses this extra point. No, sir. Uh, no, he's going <laughs> to nail it, yeah, even if you back him up 15 more yards. Let's talk a little bit about Johnny Smith, um, because I thought it was interesting in, in two reasons. Number one, the quick screen they had out to the perimeter, really nice design, a couple of good blocks out on the outside. Michael Pruitt was in there, a couple of the offensive linemen were in there as well, but then he gets up the sideline and during the game he turns on the jets and it's kind of like oh wow like oh. like he ends up kind of like he's got some speed got right yeah. and then it comes out afterwards you know because we have all these next gen stats right <laughs> that that touchdown Janu Smith reached a speed of 21.15 on, miles per hour on, as a tight end showing that uh not only is he feeling good but he's feeling 100% and fast and Arthur Smith saying that he has not seen that type of speed from him since when they were together in tennis see um good thing to have he ends up finishing the game uh with over with over 100 yards receiving in the game um he's kind of been and i don't know if i would say a surprise dj obviously the organization brought him in the offseason knowing that he's got playmaking ability but him and kyle pitts have been a really good one to punch the tight end position and and coming into the season all the conversation was you got big time receiver and Drake. Who is that? You got another big old receiver and Mac Hollins. Kyle Pitts is coming back. You draft Bijan Robinson. You still got a one thousand yard back in Tyler Algier. So all the talk on the outside was about all these other pieces that are around. And I remember hearing Arthur Smith talk about in training camp when everybody wanted to point out all these different other guys. He said, "Look." You guys better be watching out because Janu is here. Janu is a big time player for us. And not only that, I means second on the team in catches with 34. He's second on the team in yards with 422. And he's averaging 12 yards a reception. 258 yards after the catch leads the team. And that tells you how important Janu has been, also along with Kyle Pitts. I, I truly believe now. He has taken a lot of pressure off of Kyle Pitts mm-hmm. because he can also do some of the similar things. And when you turn on the tape, you say, oh, man, John New is winning just as much as Kyle Pitts. There are plays designed for John New Smith. Like you mentioned, the screen was to John New, and he takes it to the house, runs away from a defensive back. Yep. You don't see a tight end <laughs> running away from a National Football League defensive back hardly ever. But give John New a lot of credit, man. He has absolutely added uh, another big-time piece to this team, and he's just not a, oh, let's go get – you know, 8, 10, 12 yards a possession receiver. This guy has the ability to make big-time plays and has continued to do that, I thought, every single week and has become an integral piece of this offense. Yeah, um, and I also wanted to just highlight two other guys on the other side of the ball. Uh, one of the biggest storylines last week coming into this game was the loss of Grady Jarrett and what Atlanta was going to do on the defensive line when you lose your leader, you lose a playmaker, you lose a guy that, that commands so much attention yeah. in the middle of the defense. Well, it took forever, seemingly, for Clayus <laughs> Campbell to get his 100th sack, but now he gets his 102nd sack of the season, which also ended up being his third career safety, which is tied for second among active players in the National Football League, and it is fifth all-time. Tied for fifth all-time. Wow. Again, just another stat to go down in his illustrious career. And then Contavia Street traded for him last week to 
hopefully fill some of the shoes. Are you, are, are you mad that this is not an interception? <laughs> like they called it like a fumble. Exactly. Was, but are you, so are, Catavia Street <laughs> comes, not only is he traded for last week, he starts the game, and then he ends up with a fumble recovery. <laughs> I use air quotes because uh, the ball looked like an interception, but after further review, the official stat was that the ball was jarred loose from Joshua Dobbs' hands, and it was termed a fumble and recovered by Contavia Street, which game. actually uh, ended up being his first career fumble recovery. But he doesn't take very long to have his presence felt on the defensive side of the ball. Which is exactly what you want. And give a lot of credit to Terry Fontenot. Give a lot of credit to the scouting staff here with the Falcons, knowing that, okay, if we lose a particular player, guess what? They already had a guy in mind who they thought could come in here right away and have an impact, and you saw it immediately while he was out there. So give Street a lot of credit for, one, being ready for the moment and always being, you know, in this process ready to go get uh, the quarterback. But you had other guys step up, and, you know, even on the, the, the Calais Campbell uh, safety, Bud Dupree is rushing around the left edge, which is forcing Dobbs to step up into where uh, Calais gets the sack. But then if you go back and look at the tape, on that particular play, Dupree gets up the field on the left side, and David Onyemata is being blocked by three offensive linemen. <laughs> three, it takes three guys to block Onyemata. So guess what? You get one on one with Calais. You love that, and he ends up retracing steps, coming back down to to get Josh Jobs for the sack. And then you were, and, and here's another part you talk about with the defensive side of the ball. At the snap of the ball, they had seven guys at the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. and you end up rushing three. Yep. And you're talking about a guy who's coming in here who hasn't played in this system in Josh Dobbs to say, okay, who are they going to pick up? Right. Who are they going to block? Right. At the end of the day, it obviously confused that offensive line because there's no reason a Minnesota offensive line should be blocking with three guys on one. <laughs> three on one. <laughs> and leave Calais by himself and ultimately ends up being a sack and give the, the secondary a lot of credit to because they were, you know, drop eight coverage and did that. But – uh, it's awesome to see Streeter come in here and have an immediate impact and make a play in this ball game. And, you know, love the celebration going in the slide and just <laughs> chilling, got all the guys around him. And I heard him talk after the game actually to Arch, and he talked about – and he just went down the line naming five, six, seven guys. Like, man, it's pretty cool to be on this defense yeah. with all these, you know, caliber of players. Yep. And he was extremely – extremely humbled to be at Atlanta Falcon, and you love to see him have an impact. We talked a little bit about it last week. Contavious Street spent last year with the Saints, so he knows David Onyemata. He knows Ryan Nielsen, and conversely, he knows this defense, right? Yeah. So I think that's the reason why they made the move. There's not the big learning curve needed with the terminology, what Ryan Nielsen is expecting out of his defensive line, and he was able to make an impact in that game. Again, don't want to sugarcoat the result of the game. Falcons did not do enough to win, and that's what their job is in the National Football League. So, DJ, let's segue to our next conversation, which I want to kind of combine a little bit. Some of the adjustment or some of the recurring problems and then the the adjustments that need to be made moving forward. I asked you this at halftime on Sunday on our halftime show there in the stadium, Dirty Birds Live, presented by AT&T. Put on your offensive coordinator, heck, cap. Doesn't necessarily have to be offense. Could be defense, but – Let's get into some of the things that you think. This is kind of us spitballing. We are not coaches. We are not coordinators. No. Um, sometimes I wish because they get paid quite well, <laughs> but the pressure is is quite a bit. Um, kind of put on your coordinator hat and say, what are some of the recurring issues and things that you think they need to do to fix those issues? I think one thing we already talked about was the procedural penalties on the offensive side of the ball. And it goes, it correlates to exactly what my next point is is the lack of success that you had on first down. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of times in the ball game where you had negative or zero yardage plays on first down, whether you're throwing it or running it, you had negative yardage plays and you didn't get off to a fast start on this particular drive or on first down. And we have a procedural penalty and it's first and 15, or you have a holding penalty and it's first and 20, and now you're trying to catch up in the chains, that's tough to do for any team, let alone a team that needs to do things better when it comes to first down. And you're talking about the, the consistency of what you had on third down. You were at third and seven, eight or plus for a majority of this ball game, and it's because of the things that you were not able to do on first down, and now you get to second and eight, and you try to run the football, and you try to get some things going, and it doesn't happen for you. So I think, first off, the procedural opponents go in line with you have to be better on first yep. down. we got to yep. find a way to – I don't know if it's, you know, having an easy completion or if it's just simple as 
let's move our guy so that we can get two, yeah. three yards on yep. first down, which yep. is a, a huge deal. And the other part is, is what you mentioned is I think we need to maybe run the football better in the red zone. Uh -huh. And I bring back that last drive yeah. because that's exactly what we did. It's almost like where has that been all game no doubt, long, right? No doubt. And I think that is the true identity of – what this Falcons offense looks like because there's a lot of play action in the game. There's a lot of RPOs in the game. And without the threat of the run, the defense doesn't have the, the, the mindset of, okay, we need to play forward. Now we're playing backwards. We're keeping everything in front of us. So being able to run the football, I think, in the red zone is a big, big deal. Um, I, I thought the, the defense did a good job of, of getting a couple turnovers. Uh, but obviously we have to do better on some of the more explosive plays. Mm -hmm. We have to tackle better. Yeah, I thought yeah. they were – Instance in his ball game, and I, I know we go back to it a couple times, but there were a couple instances where we had Josh Dobbs corralled inside the yep. pocket. Yep. The fourth and seven play, we had him. The third and ten play before halftime where he picks up the first down, we had a chance to get a tackle on him. We had a chance to get him to the ground, and we weren't able to do that. And it's hard, as we know, to be in this league to tackle every day. They're not going to do that. Yep. You know, you don't want to bring guys to the ground, all that kind of stuff. So it's a lot tougher. So I think you mentioned it, the techniques – the fundamentals of things that you have to really uh, hone in on in a ball game is something that the, I think the Falcons have to lean back on when it comes to looking back at this tape. There was, if there was one thing that Atlanta should have known when Josh Dobbs came into the game was you had athleticism and yeah. you had a guy that they knew was going to get out of the pocket and probably should have known that a lot of the passing plays might end up going that direction. Let's get him outside of the pocket so it clears up his vision a little bit so he's not coming in here five days on a brand new team having to look through the middle of a defense, as you mentioned, sometimes with seven guys on the defensive front and try to pick apart a defense. Well, let's get him out on the perimeter a little bit. And there was That's a couple of those occasions where he got outside of contain and he used his athleticism. And Arthur Smith even said, this is a guy that's been around the league a little bit. So he knows his role and what he can provide to an offense. And he was able to do that, unfortunately, um, to the loss of the Falcons and their defense. I mean, Rick, let me ask you a question. You, you get a chance to call some of the, the biggest games every single week in college football. And – you're there every Sunday. You're watching the Falcons. You're, you're, you're intent on the things that you see. When you think about some of the things that transpired throughout the game, and you say, okay, the college game is a little bit different. But is it really that different when we're talking about some things that happen in game when you say, okay, first down, always got to win. Yeah. Third down, you know you want to win that. Turnovers, you always got to win. So at the end of the day, whether it's major college football or the NFL, that doesn't change, right? Does not change. I mean, I, I preach about it in the games that I call first college, and it, it, a lot of times it dictates the matchup. You're playing on the road. You're playing against a really good defense. Going back to your point, you have to stay on schedule with the chains, mm -hmm. right? You cannot live – you cannot win in college, and if high school for that matter, yeah. when you're playing behind the chains. you got first and 15. you got second and 17 or 18. So what is that? That's pre-snap penalties. It's holding penalties. So many times they're drive killers. But it also goes back to your point with running the – football successfully and I wanted to make this point DJ because you can appreciate it I've said it once or twice before but Alex Gibbs rest his soul who was with us a number of years ago here with the Falcons as the run game coordinator if you will he used to always preach to our offense and that's everybody offensive line running backs um, tight ends anybody involved we ran the football is get me something positive yeah. and I will never forget Alex Gibbs undressing Warwick Dunn, okay? <laughs> One of the most respected guys in oh, no. the National Football League at his time, undressing Warwick Dunn, telling him, if you dance in the hole one more time and you don't get me one or two yards, you will not play on this offense. Ooh. And to have Warwick Dunn kind of turn around and be like, who was this guy? <laughs> Alex Gibbs did not care because he had – he knew exactly what he wanted. He was a run game guru, and his deal was, you get me something. Yeah. Because he didn't want to be behind the chains. Makes sense. He would Makes much sense. rather be at second and nine, second and eight, than second and 12. Yeah. And coincidentally, at those times, we ran the football extremely well with Warwick Dunn and T.J. Duckett. Not done. saying that the Atlanta Falcons have not run the football well this year, because they have. They have. They're towards sure. the top half of the league in running the football. Um. 
But you're talking about staying away from those those negative yardage plays, whether it's pre-snap penalties, running the football effectively. Let's get to second and seven, second and six. You got so many more options as an offensive play caller if that happens. All right, DJ, let's kind of spin it forward a little bit and let's talk about what Atlanta is going to face this week. They're going to go back on the road. They're going to Arizona, face the Arizona Cardinals. Well, here's the good news. If you're a Falcons fan, Arizona Cardinals are one and eight. Okay, <laughs> remember that guy, Josh Dobbs. Um, he was the starter for the Arizona Cardinals the entire year, eight games. Crazy. And they didn't play too well. And they traded him away to Minnesota. <laughs> and, well, he played pretty well for Minnesota last week. Yeah. Um, however, Cleveland – or, excuse me, Arizona went on the road last week to Cleveland with a quarterback named Clayton Toon who did not do very well. 58 no. yards passing, and the Cardinals lost 27 to nothing to the Browns. Now, here's the change. Kyler Murray is expected to be back this week. He's going to come off of IR. Remember, he's recovering from an ACL injury that happened last year in week 14. It's a guy that's been to two Pro Bowls. He was a 2019 Offensive Player of the Year by AP. We don't know whether or not he's going to be Kyler Murray of old. Right. But what we do know is he is a competitor and he is extremely athletic. So talk to me, talk to us about what Atlanta is going to see with this Arizona Cardinals team this week on the road. The big thing, I, I think, when it comes to possibly seeing Kyler Murray, and it goes back, and I can understand it wholeheartedly, him coming back, and this if he does play, there's going to be times in the game where the Falcons have to have really great contain. Because as a guy who's just getting his feet back into the game and trying to you know fill out the speed, sometimes you don't see it as fast as you would if you're playing a lot when you're talking about throwing the football. And my point here is there's going to be times where he wants to just create. There's going to be times where he wants to get outside the pocket where everything slows down for him. Mm -hmm. As an athletic quarterback, I've been there. The, the, the most comfortable sometimes you are is when you can get out and you have the option to run or throw. And I guarantee you he's going to turn on the tape and he's going to see Josh Dobbs yeah. outside <laughs> creating and he's going to feel like, okay, there's chances for me to win there. So I think – Coming into this ball game, defensively, you're talking about being able to rush this quarterback in a disciplined way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's times where you rush a quarterback and you're trying to get to the top and then you retrace yourself and come back. There's times where you rush a quarterback where you literally get no rush and you're literally just playing basketball, just watching him and seeing once he moves. Like you got four spies out there. Yep, yep. This is a game where I think you got to force the issue with Murray. When I say forced issue, that means get the proper rush, Jeff, and make sure you're rushing with discipline. But you got to collapse that pocket on the inside. You got to make him kind of think faster than he wants to because he's going to want things to slow down in his first start. He hasn't played in I don't know how long. It's been so long since he's been in live game action. Mm -hmm. This is a ball game I think you have to get. We, we don't know if Connor's coming back. He's been out the last three ball games. All he wants to have a run game. Last week, Clayton Toon was the leading rusher with yeah. 28 yards. The rest of the team – 13 yards. Yeah. Coming into yep. last week's ball game, Minnesota didn't rush the ball really well. They end up rushing the ball better in the second half. But this is another instance where if they can control the clock, they cannot put Kyler in those third and long situations where they do not want to be where any team doesn't want to be. It gives them an opportunity in this game. They got some really good players, Rondell Moore, Marquise Brown on the outside, on the defense side, Buda Baker is a guy, Kazir White uh, is their leading uh, tackler and linebacker. Uh, they've given up 26 points per game uh, this season, and they're only rushing for They've given up 120 yards rushing the game and 223 pass yards. So, you know, this is a, a team that's been up and down. They're 1-8. and eight. They're at home, like you mentioned. I'm not sure where their team morale is. Right, right. But I guarantee you, if they turn on the tape and they say, well, this is a Minnesota Vikings team that didn't have X, Y, and Z, yep. and they found a way. Yep. So there's going to be some – some some hope in that team coming in. Mm -hmm. But here's an opportunity for you to go on the road before your bye week and feel good about the product you put on the field. And yep. I think this is a great opportunity for the Falcons to do so. You're playing another NFC opponent. Yep. And it's ultra important that you go into this bye week off a road game, feeling good about where you are and getting back to 500. So uh, this is a team that lost six straight ball games. I'm not sure – if this team has melded in already. And it's yeah. hard to say that with professional players, but you're one and eight knowing that your future is probably not in this season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're playing for, you know, your professional careers for sure. But here's an opportunity for the Falcons to say, all right, it's our time to get back to playing our style of football and dominate this team. 
that one victory for the Arizona Cardinals was an unexpected Cowboys. upset victory over the Cowboys with Josh Dobbs <laughs> at quarterback. But ever after that, he was not able to win another football game. I think it's a great point you bring up the morale. Like you don't know where Arizona is at. You could probably make the same argument for Atlanta. True. Here's what I can tell you uh, from experience, and I'm sure DJ can can do that as well because we played on a couple of the same teams, is unfortunately in the NFL this happens. You get on losing streaks, and everybody wants to point their finger. Everybody wants to tear the team down. Everybody wants to make changes. Everybody wants to start thinking about next year. Should we do this so we can go get X, Y, or Z player in the draft? Right. Always right. thinking that the next player in the draft is going to change your organization. Sometimes it does. Most of the time it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> okay? Um, but what DJ said I think is so important in this, and, it, and it's hard for the average person, average fan to understand, is these guys are professionals, and they have to approach everything as professionals, not just their mechanics, not just their technique, but this thing up here, mm -hmm. right? And how do they come in week after week? How does this team, as we tape here on a Tuesday, come in on a Wednesday, the first day of the work week, with the attitude of positivity, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to go out and get a victory? You know how they do that? That's their job as professionals. Sure. They get paid a lot of money because they're really good athletes and they can make plays, but they're also professionals. So they got to bring their mind and their brain as much right now as they bring the physical side of football. I know that's hard to grasp for some people, but that's what we have been presented. When we sit down in those team meetings after a couple straight losses yeah. against teams that you should beat, those are the discussions that yeah. you have in the meeting room. And here's one thing I want I want fans to understand, and, and I don't think this is something that's difficult to, to kind of grasp, is in this particular league, if you do not do your job, guess what? There's somebody else who can do it, and they will find that person. There's yep. a scouting staff that is constantly – looking at other players that they can add to the roster that will give this team an advantage. And I don't think that's any different from anybody in your everyday work life. Sure. If you're not doing your particular job, they're going to find somebody else to do it. So let's, this team is doing everything they can to be the best for this organization, for this city, and they're trying hard, trust me. And I know it doesn't feel like it. I know fans get, you know, frustrated. And trust me, we get frustrated too. <laughs> yeah. We want the best for this organization as well. And these guys just have some instances in a ball game where things don't go the way that it should. So don't ever think this team is not trying hard. Don't ever think this team is not giving everything they have for it because, you know, we're here. We see the team put in work. We know these coaches put in countless hours to get the job done. So this is a team that is fighting its tail off to get to a position where this city is proud of. So, of course, you should be frustrated. You should be mad yeah. because that means you care about your team. Guess yep. what? This team does as well, and they're doing their hardest to try to bring back wins every single week. Frustrating the last couple of weeks. But here's what I will tell you. And, and DJ, let's just talk about this before we close. Is and, and Arthur Smith mentioned this in his press conference yesterday. Everything that this team wants to achieve this season is still in front of them. Make it's sure. still in front Good of call. them. They're four and five right now. The Saints are five and four because they get a victory uh, against the Bears on Sunday. Let's look at real quickly. They've got eight games remaining. Obviously, Arizona this week, which is a team that's one and eight. I went back and I looked at the final eight opponents that they have, and I looked at what their win loss record is right now. The rest of their schedule is 20 and 40 this year. <laughs> Okay, wow. 20 wins and 40 losses. There is one team that they play that has a winning record. It happens to be the Saints. They've got to play them twice. Everybody else on their roster or on their schedule this year is at 500 or less. So it's not like they're facing murderers row. Yeah. They don't have to go up against Philly and Pittsburgh and Baltimore and Dallas and all in San Francisco, right? Yep. They've got a very manageable schedule. They have to take care of their business, which is one week at a time. For sure. They got to go win against Arizona, as you mentioned, to give themselves some momentum, some positivity going into the bye week. Then rest up, unload a little bit, maybe kind of clear their mind, and then get ready for the back half of the schedule, if you will, which is going to be very division heavy. Atlanta is 2 and 0 in the division right now. So good. Okay? Oh man, that's 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 such a great point you bring up. You're 2 and 0 in division as 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 tough as it feels right now yeah. at 4 and 5. You still control your own division, which mm -hmm. is great. And you mentioned it. You still got two games left against the Saints. You got to play the Panthers again, play the Bucks again. You, you still have an opportunity to play all your teams in your division. 
you play well in those games, guess what? You got a chance in January. Yeah. Yep. So, again, take it one week at a time, but everything is manageable. Everything is still attainable, and their focus at the end of the season is win the division. And then you just never know what's going to happen because somebody's got to come to town to play you in the postseason. I know. And then all you got to do is just get on a run, right? It happens. But it all starts with winning one game at a time, and that's uh, this weekend at Arizona. So that's going to wrap it up here for the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Just like DJ said, I mentioned it. I know people are frustrated. The people in this building are frustrated. Everybody is. They're upset. Yeah. They're mad. And they want to turn things around. And the only way you can turn things around is going out on the field and producing and executing and finding a way to come away with one more point than go. the other team does. So hopefully that happens this weekend, and we will back, be back here next week to talk about that. Um, and maybe be a full compliment up here on the set as well with well, sure, uh, Arch with Arch back. getting yeah, back get here. Get our, get our Arch, we miss you, bro. But in the meantime, we held it, hope we held it down for you, Arch. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Continue to like, subscribe, and review on Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, or YouTube, or however you get your podcast content. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. See you next time.